Yeah, I don't know how consent would wipe that away because if a 15 or 16 year old came up to me and came on to me, I'd be like, what? Like, no, 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 no. Like, I mean, it's, it is your responsibility as an adult to rebuff that sort of advance. Back off, Indy. Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down the Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but they were sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Welcome, 30-somethings and 40-somethings, to Shat the Movies, the podcast where we ask, were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday nights searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you even remember what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, then this is the podcast for you. I'm your host, Gene Lyons, and with me is my co-host, Dick Ebert. Good evening. And we'll take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. Each week, the audience selects from four movie choices. Then we break out our race car VHS tape rewinder and watch the movie that tallied the highest number of votes. At the end of each podcast, Big D and I will provide the audience with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off our respective bums. Find a comfortable spot on your sofa and accompany us for a journey through our vast VHS movie collections. This week, we voted for Steven Spielberg movies, E.T., Hook, Jurassic Park, and Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, this was a fan suggestion for a category and great movies across the board. And I was happy to sit down again last night and revisit a piece of my childhood and have it live up to my memory and and really stay true to what I think the movie was, you know, 36 years ago. Yeah, Big D, we really couldn't have gone wrong with any of these movies. All of them are fantastic. I loved E.T., really enjoyed Hook. Jurassic Park's one of my all-time favorites. And, of course, Raiders of the Lost Ark. I was kind of late to that movie, but it really is uh, wonderful and it holds up. Um, This is actually feels really good after watching Batman last week and having to suffer through having my childhood dreams crushed. You said in the intro, you're welcome 30-somethings and 40-somethings. This movie in a few weeks is going to be 36 years old. So you might even be saying, welcome 50-somethings and 60-somethings. We're pushing the boundary of the year brackets that we do for the movies. And this movie did not feel 36 years old. This felt like it was a current movie that could have been released today with a few special effects tweaks needed. But where did you first see this and what's your first memories? So I was actually 23 years old. I just moved out of Arizona into California for my first newspaper job in Yuba City, California. And I had this little cottage and down the street, there was this old like dilapidated movie theater and they did a Bruin view. And now these are pretty popular, but back then this was like revolutionary, right? We screen an old movie and, uh, you know, you serve beers. I think this was actually BYOB. So it ended up being a, a real shit show, but that was the first time I saw it as a midnight showing. I got so drunk and enjoyed it so much. I was cheering at the screen. I think I downed like a six pack, maybe a 12 pack. And on my way home, I fell into a bush uh, and fell asleep about 200 yards from my house uh, and had these very vivid Indiana Jones dreams. Uh, I just regretted not seeing it as a kid. This was kind of a dividing factor for me because white kids would always talk about how much they loved Indiana Jones. And I took that as that was my first sense, I think, of being the other is that as a kid, I think that's why I didn't watch it was I was like, well, that's that's what those kids watch. I'm different. This was in my pantheon of movie going experience. This is easily number two for me. My number one would never be topped. I saw Star Wars A New Hope in a drive-in theater in Kingston, New York, in the back of my parents' station wagon with my X-Wing fighter. So nothing will top that, but Indiana came pretty close. Yeah, I think both of those are are fairly epic movies, too. So it's really fascinating to think that within a a three-year span, basically, uh, you had George Lucas involved with these two massive projects that were both absolute masterpieces. So, Gene, you were older at this point, so you you didn't have a chance to get any of the toys. But I got to tell you, I really had to have the Indiana Jones Well of Souls kit and also the Map Room kit. It had the, the staff, it had the snakes, the torches, the ark. But at that point, they were probably like 10 bucks a piece, and I couldn't afford it. When I finally saved up and went to the store and got them, I can feel it today. As an adult, you start to lose that excitement for things. You know, when I bought a house, you get a car, you you buy things, big ticket items now. I've never gotten as much joy as I did getting these little plastic Kenner toy kits. 
You didn't play with these, obviously, at 20, but what toys did you play with growing up? So I most of mine were hand-me-downs. I have like a bazillion cousins, and I'm kind of in the middle of the pack. And so uh, for me, it was a lot of G.I. Joe. I even got some Barbie hand-me-downs. Thundercats were really, really big for me. Um, I didn't own any of the Indiana Jones toys. I don't think I owned a single one, but I saw you sent me some pictures of the throne room, and it looks awesome. It even came with like a little uh, a monocle, like an eyepiece that you could look through. And you'd be able to see on the map room floor where the Ark was buried. Amazing. I don't know what happened to it, but I looked on eBay because I wanted to kind of rekindle my childhood. And they're like 450 bucks. So I will not be getting a new map room to play with my daughter. Yeah, I don't know if I told this story on the podcast before, but my, my brother died when I was two years old and I inherited all of his toys. And he had like every Star Wars toy you can imagine. And uh, I did stupid shit as a kid. Like I took the Millennium Falcon and threw it off a second story building to like make it fly. And it just crashed. So I, mean, I had all these amazing toys. I've got photos with them. And now they're all like, you know, they've been relegated to the uh, to the dustbin of history. So way to go, young Gene. Uh, the movie, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, is about a renowned archaeologist and expert in the occult, Dr. Indiana Jones. He's hired by the U.S. government to find the Ark of the Covenant, which is believed to still hold the Ten Commandments. Unfortunately, agents of Hitler are also after the Ark. As you mentioned before, Big D, this movie came out in 1981 and was directed by Steven Spielberg with a screenplay by George Lucas, starring Harrison Ford, Karen Allen, and Paul Freeman. Yeah, this was, in 81, this was a big deal. This was the number one movie of the year. It made $212 million. For 81, that's huge. If you do adjusted domestic gross, that's $782 million. It ranks number 21 on the overall list. Uh, and IMDb has it ranked as number 39 on the all-time top 100 films. And, you know, that may not sound like that high a ranking, but you got to remember that from a critical perspective, from a greatest movies of all time perspective if you look at them the majority of them are going to be i mean you're coming up against heavyweights dramas movies that take themselves very seriously this is by and large a fantasy action movie uh, also it was really hard if you look back and look at the 80s and look at when they were trying to make period pieces right when they were trying to make something that looked like world war ii or the 1930s usually time it, it was awful yeah, this movie was beautiful and even in that time period it was recognized as something special it won five Academy Awards. It was it was also nominated for four of the big Academy categories. Didn't win those: Best Picture, Best Director, uh, Cinematography, and John Williams Score was also nominated. So, at the time, it was nice to see they recognized it. Today, the Academy seems to be a bit snobbish, and I don't imagine this film would get the respect it deserves today. No, I agree with you. And we mentioned it before uh, with Aliens, that back in that period in the 80s, you could win legitimate awards, at least be nominated for Oscars uh, in a way that I don't think would happen today. I think sci-fi, fantasy, action movies have really been relegated to sort of the second tier of film. All right, without further ado, Big D, roll that trailer. For nearly 3,000 years, man has searched for the lost Ark of the Covenant. The Bible speaks of the Ark leveling mountains and laying waste to entire regions. Not something to be taken lightly. No one knows its secrets. Jones, do you realize what the Ark is? It's a transmitter. It's a radio for speaking to God. An army which carries the Ark before it is invincible. The Ark, if it is there, Atanis, then it is something that man was not meant to disturb. It is protected by forces beyond imagination. It is desired above all treasures on earth by those who are good, trust me, and those who are evil. I tell you everything. Yes, I know you will. Raiders of the Lost Ark. Let it go. Hey, we have no time. If you still want the Ark, it has been loaded onto a truck for Cairo. Raiders of the Lost Ark. A film from Steven Spielberg and George Lucas.
In 1936, archaeologist Indiana Jones braves an ancient booby trap temple in Peru and retrieves a golden idol. He is confronted by rival archaeologist Rene Belloc and the indigenous Jovito people. Surrounded and outnumbered, Indy surrenders the idol to Belloc and escapes aboard a waiting float plane. So I love the way they introduce the character of Indiana Jones. We get to meet Indiana Jones, the adventurer, first. Then the academic, Dr. Jones, second. They let us go three minutes and 16 seconds into this opening sequence in the jungle that's, that's filled with tension. You don't know who the group is. You don't know who you can trust. And then in an instant, when Indiana's about to get killed, he turns around, brandishes the whip, whips it out of the guy's hand. We get to see the opening temple escape. It establishes Indiana's baseline abilities and who he is as a character in less than eight minutes and saves probably 45 minutes that a less talented director or writer would have wasted on unneeded exposition. Right. You mentioned those opening minutes. I don't know if there's a more iconic opening few minutes in film. Uh, The Indiana Jones outfit, that hat, the leather jacket, the whip, the pistol, uh, tomb raiding by torchlight, booby trap ruins, a pressure sensitive altar, all these things you see mimicked in movies to this day, whether it's, you know, Tomb Raider or other movies that are paying homage to Indiana Jones or just flat out ripping it off. Uh, you also see the running from the hostile natives, that scene where he's coming over the hill, going to the float plane. This movie has an unforgettable look and feel. I felt myself trying to resist and immediately and eventually falling in love. Uh, there's some cheesy parts with the dead bodies and stuff like that, but I like that they did that. It's counter. It's fun. Uh, some of the dead bodies don't look quite real. The, the lighting is always perfect. You can always see his face, you know, the, the rocks at times you see them kind of bounce like foam, but this is a universe that's being set up for fun. It's a clear message from the movie. Indy, he's funny without being slapstick. He's endearing, but he's not hammy. It's a it's a fine line to walk, and Harrison Ford just nails it. You could tell, unlike Blade Runner, he's having a lot of fun. I, I also enjoy the fun aspects. The movie is is an homage to the older adventure films, you know, like Casablanca. We we talk about some of the movies in the fifties and the way they depicted adventure, but the character of Indiana, it had to have really sparked an interest in archaeology and history. It was the first time for me that I remember thinking, wow, history's kind of cool. And I got more into studying. And the idea of ancient ruins and adventure was something that was new to me. And I really think the field of archaeology probably benefited from this movie, much like the Navy uh, and pilots benefited from Top Gun in 84. You mentioned that they show Indiana Jones the adventure before they show Indiana Jones the professor. I actually liked, though, that they took a few minutes to show him in his professorial role, right? And so you get why he's doing what he's doing, which really sets up a clash there between, you know, he's not a pure government man. He's also not, you know, necessarily, I mean, obviously he doesn't like the Nazis, but this is about more for him. This is an educational pursuit, although it is action-packed. Um, and it really kind of does set that a holistic view of this guy, that he's 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 not just brawn, he's got some brains there too, which he does demonstrate throughout the movie. I, I just really like that they took the, you know, I think, what, three or four minutes to have him in, in the classroom and then having the discussion uh, with the governance spooks. Well, I want to know what your thoughts on on his character is. Growing up, and even till this rewatch, and that's why we rewatch these movies, to look at them now as an adult and see if there were themes or actions within a movie that today we can look at through a different lens. And I always viewed Indiana Jones as an altruistic, uh, you know, he was the honest archaeologist. But watching this again, I start to question it. Was Indiana a true archaeologist or was he a grave robbing, looting thief, just like Belloc. I don't think he was a true archaeologist in the sense that he wasn't really studying everything going on around him, uh, but he was very much driven by the pursuit rather than anything else. I think for him, it was about doing the undoable, you know, finding discoveries. You can see when they open the well of souls, or you can see when he finds the golden idol, that there's a degree of wonder being expressed by Harrison Ford. I think he really is in it for the the love of it. I, I think he's very different from Belloc. You see, Belloc is, you know, he's he's into luxury. Uh, he is all about, you know, he doesn't care about the discovery. He just wants to get the goods. If I think of Indiana Jones, if he, if he if he had the opportunity to steal something from someone else, he wouldn't do it. 
But that's what he's doing. Oh, from dead people? No, he doesn't have the permitting needed. Now, Belloc says it just takes a little nudge for you to become me. Indiana does not like that comparison. And I got to believe he is closer to Belloc than we want to remember. I did a little search after the movie to see if anyone else agreed. And archaeologists hate Indiana. They think he's an awful representation of what they do. They call him a grave robber. I'm going to add a link into the notes so you can read it, where they said if he was a true archaeologist, he would have not cared about the gold statue. He would have passed it off to the Nazis and spent the next 10 years studying the temple's booby traps and the culture. And that was a great archaeological find. And Indiana just destroys everywhere he goes for a few trinkets to take home and sell illegally. So Indiana Jones returns to his teaching position at Marshall College, where he's interviewed by two army intelligence agents. They inform him that the Nazis are searching for his old mentor, Abner Ravenwood, under whom Jones studied at the University of Chicago. The Nazis know Ravenwood is the leading expert in the ancient city of Tennis in Egypt, and he possesses the headpiece of the Staff of Ra. Jones deduces that the Nazis are searching for the Ark of the Covenant. The Nazis believe that if they acquire the Ark, their armies will become invincible. The Staff of Ra is the key to finding the Well of Souls, a secret chamber in which the Ark is buried. Uh, this, to me, like, I thought the movie was great already. And then they're like, you know what? Let's throw in some Nazis. It takes real balls by the, the makers of this movie to try. You're trying to fit in Nazis, the Ark of the Covenant, but also make it action-packed and then also make it kind of funny and a family movie. They dared to do it. They nailed it. I, I'm still like, I can't get over how good this movie is. Yeah, I don't know if the studios would have been that brave today. Um, but I got to ask, does this movie work for you without Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones? I I'm watching it with my wife, and I turned to her and I said, man, he I said, he's a good-looking guy. He is charismatic. To me, he carries the movie. I don't know if it works as well without him. Yeah, I'm a big Harrison Ford fan, and this is my favorite role that he played. A lot of people refer to Han Solo, and Han Solo's good. But he is Indiana Jones. I mean, there are, there are times when he's uh, the, the the scene where he's you know taking on six different dudes in Cairo, and he's got you know the, he's sweating, the shirt's kind of split half open, he's got the whip out, and I'm just like, man, this guy is killing it. He is he's so iconic and looks really really good. His play as a as a romantic counterpart isn't overdone uh, with Marion. He's he plays off that you could tell that he's attracted to her, but that she's not ruling his mind. But he has a certain vulnerability toward her. Uh, again, when he's faced with danger, he's got a bravery, but also he has moments where you can see the fear. He's be There's a lot of range here that if you really go back and you watch this movie and you watch his performance in it, you're going, I don't know anybody else who could do this. Originally, it was supposed to be Tom Selleck, but he couldn't get out of his Magnum P.I. contract. He makes a good adventure and played an Indiana Jones type in High Road to China, one of the, the many Raiders of the Lost Ark ripoffs that were generated after this. But he is no Harrison Ford. I think the cool thing about Tom Selleck, though, is it'd be a lot easier to explain how Tom Selleck could infiltrate uh, a, a dig site with a bunch of Arabs. You know, I, when I was growing up, I, being uh, Persian, he looks like most of my uncles. So I think that, you know, that is a little more believable. Harrison Ford kind of stuck out like a sore thumb as Indiana Jones. I mean, he was, he was a pretty white dude in a non-white world. Um, and honestly, I, th I thought it would be more believable if he actually posed as a Nazi than uh, as an Arab. Well, what's cool is this movie created an entire genre. Right after it, every studio tried to create their own Indiana. From the further adventures of Tennessee Buck in 88, Jungle Raiders, Treasures of the Four Crowns in 83. Probably the only one that was really effective was Romancing the Stone. But to develop an entire genre and have people copy the formula it shows you that they were right on and, and they hit a home run with this movie. And you mentioned Romancing the Stone. Romancing the Stone was successful because it was just different enough from this, right? Like it had a, a very different vibe. Um, I think the closest you can get really to this, again, is, is you know, you can even argue that Goonies in a way was sort of an Indiana Jones style movie. But again, I think that they had to find varying degrees of difference. You get too close to the original, you know, as, uh, as Omar says in The Wire, you come at the king, you best not miss. This spawned many adventures I had as a kid. Rock climbing, uh, burying treasure. So when Goonies came out, I remember thinking that was 
the adventure for me and my friends. So I think you're spot on with the comparison. So moving the story along, the agents authorize Indiana Jones to recover the Ark to prevent the Nazis from obtaining it. He travels to Nepal and discovers that Abner has died and the headpiece is in the possession of Ravenwood's daughter, Marion. Jones visits Marion at her tavern where she reveals her bitter feelings toward him from a previous romantic affair. She physically rebuffs his offer to buy the headpiece and Jones leaves. Shortly after, a group of thugs arrive with their Nazi commander, Arnold Tote, Tote threatens Marion to get the headpiece, but when Jones returns to the bar to fight the Nazis and save Marion, her bar is accidentally set on fire. During the fight, the headpiece ends up in the fire, and Tote severely burns his hand trying to take the hot headpiece. He flees the tavern screaming. Indy and Marion escape with the headpiece, and Marion decides to accompany Indy in his search for the Ark so he can repay his debt to her. So the action here, I think, is fantastic. The choreography was was tense and fun. Anytime you can have Indiana sliding down a bar and he's about to get burned and he can turn around to Marion and whisper, whiskey, and then hit somebody over the head with a bottle. Yeah, this scene is a perfect mix of action, suspense, comedy, and so imaginative. Uh, just the way that they use the space, the hot poker, the fire, breaking bottles, gunfire, you know, turning tables over, people switching positions all over the place. It was, I loved it. Uh, you mentioned the whiskey scene. I love when the bullet goes, you know, through the keg and Marion just takes a drink in the middle of, of everything that's going on. It reminded me so much of the Disneyland ride, the Indiana Jones ride, where, uh, you know, you can't help but laugh, but at the same time, you're being thrilled. I, I'm in love with this scene. This is probably my favorite scene in the entire movie. Going in, one of the most iconic things that you always remember are the traveling montages with the map animation. This is important today because you got to remember back in 36, that travel must have taken Indiana, how long you think, like two or three weeks? Oh, yeah, easily. There's no direct flights to Nepal. He lands in Hawaii. He probably does like 13, 15 connections. And it does a great job to show the scale and the scope of this movie. It is a complete global adventure. Yeah, you mentioned that that travel and that kind of throwback map, you know, that we're really trying to put ourselves in that era. Uh, you mentioned before the movie Casablanca. And, you know, as you look at this movie and you keep Casablanca in mind, the lighting, the shadows, there are so many nods, even when you get to having like essentially that that beautiful entrance into the bar. But it's kind of twisted in its own Indiana Jones sort of way, which brings us to Marion. She's got to be the most attractive 80s heroine we've covered on this podcast. She's a hard drinker. She's got a punch. She's, you know, undeniably beautiful. I just really like seeing her on the screen. I couldn't get enough of that character. I, I think she's a real woman. She is well-rounded. She's strong. I thought she's beautiful. Uh, but another reason that we go to look back at these movies is to see if we pick up on some questionable subjects. So I've been wrong in the past. You know, Roger last week thought I was crazy for thinking that Batman should have waited for Vicky to be sober before he took her up to the room and had sex with her. Did you pick up any weird uh, vibe or origin story between Indiana and Marion's relationship? Well, upon this viewing of the movie, I did notice that she says this one thing where she says, I was a child uh, when they're talking about their failed, you know, romance. And at first I kind of cringed and I thought, oh, she's probably saying like, you know, metaphorically, basically that I didn't know a lot about the world. I was so young and naive, not necessarily implying that Indy wasn't. But uh, after you and I talked, I think you got a little different take on this. Yeah, I have a very different take on it, especially considering that this scene follows Indiana in the classroom and Marshall. His class is probably 80 to 90% female. It's obvious that many of them there aren't for the academics, that they're in love with him. I immediately took this line to be like, was she a student of his that he had an affair with? So I dug a little deeper and it gets worse. Indiana walks in. Marion says, I've learned to hate you in the last 10 years. Indiana, I've never meant to hurt you. Marion, I was a child. I was in love. It was wrong and you knew it. Indiana says, you knew what you were doing. Marion says, now I do. This is my place. Get out. Indiana just admitted to having sex with a minor, didn't he? No, again, I... Th I saw it as metaphorical, not literally a child, but, you know, something like like if I were talking about my 20s and, and a failed relationship, I would say, you know, we were kids and, you know, we we messed up or something like that. Doesn't mean we we're literally children, but just, you know, it's it's metaphor. At least that's how I took it. 
No, this is no metaphor. The age difference is obvious. And there's actually a famous transcript from 78 when Lucas and Spielberg and, and Lawrence Kasdan were fleshing out the character. And they're having a conversation about statutory rape, about how young is too young and how old is too old and what the age range was. They debated the age of Marion and Lucas wanted to make her 12 years old. And they questioned what age it was okay for Indiana to be sleeping with her. 15 and 16 years old is what they finally settled on, that they felt that uh, the audience would not get upset. Uh, I don't think that would fly today. And I think people would have been outraged at the, the thought of Indiana having sex with a child as long as she consented. Yeah, I don't know how consent would wipe that away because, I mean, if you think of it from the perspective, all right, so right now I'm 37 years old, okay? If uh, if a 15 or 16-year-old came up to me and came on to me, I'd be like, what? Like, no, 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 no. Like, I mean, it's, it is your responsibility as an adult to rebuff that sort of advance. There is no way, no matter how forward a child is, that that is absolutely not okay. We talked about, again, Vicki Vale and informed consent. A child can't give informed consent. Back off, Indy. So as much as we love Marion, she's obviously had a, a tough road, and I feel for her. She still wants to go with Indiana, so uh, I don't know. I still love her, but Indiana just uh, got knocked down a little peg for me. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's why she decided to go to Nepal. Like, she just needs some time to get away. Uh, you know, th- another thing that Marion does, though, uh, speaking of being reckless here, is uh, she breaks a cardinal rule of firearms. Now, Big D, you've got, you know, training obviously with firearms i was always taught you know the three or four rules depending on who you ask of firearms and one of them is always know your target and what's behind it several times in this movie we see somebody shoot a person when a person they're trying to protect is immediately behind that person a uh, super risky move and so you know when you mentioned the violence in this scene you see a guy get shot through the head and a guy get shot through the back with blood coming out of their mouths but more importantly we have some really dangerous situations where both the protagonist and his i guess female sidekick are are really taking risks so forget about uh, you know, weapon control and where you should aim Marion has just downed what looks like 35 shots. So forget the fact that she's aiming in Indiana Jones's direction. She is probably pissed drunk. She'd probably like blow a .3. I'm surprised she hits anything, let alone the guy actually trying to kill Indiana. Don't mix liquor and firearms, please. I mean, to, to be fair, she's like three feet behind him. So I'll, I'll, I'll give her that. So the pair travels to Cairo where they meet up with Indy's friend Salah a skilled excavator, and white guy. Salah informs that Belloc and the Nazis are digging for the Well of Souls with the replica of the headpiece created from the scar on Tote's hand. They quickly realize the Nazi headpiece is incomplete and that the Nazis are digging in the wrong place. The Nazis kidnap Marion, and it appears to Jones that she is killed in an exploding truck. After a confrontation with Belloc in a local bar, Indy and Salah infiltrate the Nazi dig site and use their staff to correctly locate the Ark. Indy discovers Marion is alive, bound and gagged in a tent, but does not release her for fear of alerting the Nazis. Indy, Salah, and a small group of diggers unearth the Well of Souls and acquire the Ark. Belloc and Nazi officer Colonel Dietrich arrive, seize the Ark from Jones, throwing Marion into the Well of Souls with him before sealing it back up. Jones and Marion escape to a local airstrip where Jones has a fist fight with a Nazi mechanic and destroys the flying wing that was to transport the Ark to Berlin. The panicked Nazis remove the Ark in a truck and set off for Cairo, but Jones catches them and retakes it. He makes arrangements to take the Ark to London aboard a tramp steamer. Okay, so maybe we should have broken this uh, section of the plot up better because this this five or six sentences have probably five or six of the most iconic scenes in cinematic history. We could talk about the the bigger shots, but I want to take one second to just talk about a smaller shot. And that's when Indy and Belloc are are having their conversation. Uh, It's a one-on-one. Well, Indy thinks it's a one-on-one until he realizes that everybody around him has got rifles trained on him. But uh, Belloc is in the background uh, in focus, and it's a soft focus while Indy is out of focus in the foreground. He's gritting his teeth. This is the scene that you mentioned before where Belloc is accusing Indy of being just like him. It's a nice long shot. The camera doesn't switch. It's very creative, but it's not flashy. 
Uh, the arc itself looks super cool. When they're lifting it up, they got that two-pole set up. There's just a lot of choices in the cinematography here, the angles that they're using. Again, neither of us is a fine film connoisseur. I was you know, not trained in cinematography. And so when a movie makes me sit up and notice, wow, this is beautifully shot, I really appreciate that. And this is one of the few movies that we've seen where I, I took a second I looked at the way something was framed, the way it was lit. We talked about the lighting before and just thought, man, they really nailed it. Yeah, there's so many iconic scenes. You have the market where Indiana is confronted by the the swordsman. He's distracted. He just shoots the guy. Did you know the origin of that, that that wasn't the original plot? Yeah, prior to you telling me, I had no idea. I think this is a story worth going into and and devoting a few minutes to because it's great. So I think it sets Indiana's character. It really tells us a lot about him, but that wasn't the intent. There was supposed to be an entire set piece sequence where he fights and and disarms him. Then there's some other henchmen that come in. But the entire crew, when they were filming in Tunisia, and it was 100 degrees out, food was different. They weren't used to the water. Almost the entire crew got sick, with the exception of Spielberg. So when it came time to film this set, it was 105 degrees and Harrison Ford had come down with dysentery. Uh, He couldn't film more than 10 minutes at a time without having to run to the bathroom. So they had to come up with a workaround. Instead of doing the fight sequence, they just off the cuff said, hey, how about if I just shoot him? They pulled out, they did it, they shot it once. But this poor guy, he had trained for like five months and just to get cut out like that over some uh, dysentery. I feel bad for that guy, but iconic scene to this day. The fascinating thing about that story is that since this scene was shot, how many times have you seen another movie uh, you know, copy this where there's some big flashy show by the attacker and then your hero just, you know, does some sort of, you know, a flippant quick action that that shows, you know, his, his cool, that shows his uh, his resourcefulness. Uh, so, again, it's it's fascinating that this these real life events came together to, to really change filmmaking or at least to change writing. Um, not to be fanboys about this movie. I do want to point out that although I love this movie, there are some issues uh that i take with it and i'll I'll bring these up over the next couple minutes but for first dose i would say so marion is presumably killed in this explosion i think everybody knows she's not dead the movie can't happen that way uh but she gets blown up anything she's blown up he doesn't look for a body after the explosion and then he just goes he's just been attacked in this city he goes and sits down and has a drink with his back to the bazaar after nearly being killed and then, when invited, goes along with the Nazis. Does this make any sense to you? Do you not have problems with this? Like To me, I think that the only reason we're forgiving this is because we like the story so much that we're willing to just go along with it. Indiana's clearly reckless. He could have easily been killed. This was, I think, the same bar where he was almost ambushed and kidnapped before to return there. And we're led to believe he downs almost an entire bottle. Crazy. Maybe Indiana at this point just wants to die. But do I need to worry if I ever travel to the Middle East about bad dates just just killing me i I took this scene as salah being funny like in in, in a coarse way like he's basically saying like i think he understands they're poisoned no 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 no. hold on you think he understands they're poisoned you wouldn't then search your house where your children your entire family is to think there's an assassin hiding in your house all right we've already established that indy is willing to drink where he was almost killed i think salah is there's no caution in this movie I mean, there are two guys going into a camp full of Nazis with no backup. Like, these guys are not really into self-preservation. But no, dates do not kill you like that. The the worst I've had is a a particularly squishy one, and that's about it. They do look and feel like roaches, though. I don't understand why anybody eats these things. They're very popular in my family. They gross me out. So, speaking of Salah and Indy, they, they infiltrate this Nazi camp. And this is one of those other issues where I know it's Disney-ish. I know that we're supposed to just accept this. But the hieroglyphics in the stone room, they, they look like they were painted just yesterday. They're in full color. They're easy to read. Uh, the model of the ancient city looks like it was made out of, you know, balsam wood, like just a day before. Uh, this is like an archaeologist's dream come true. The ark is shiny when they find it. Uh, you know, the when the sun goes through the uh, the headpiece, it shoots this like weird laser beam and stuff. I, I thought that they could have done a little bit better job of making this place look a little more weathered, a little more realistic. I thought this is one misstep in the in the film's production. No, I kind of liked it. <laughs> I don't want to watch Indiana breaking out the broom and having to you know sweep off the entire map room floor. 
I liked it. I just kind of felt bad that you know Indiana is, is vandalizing as he goes. He's not taking care or trying to preserve these artifacts. But how did they not find the back entrance into the Well of Souls? It backed up right to the airstrip. There's a brick missing. So that's another problem I have. So let, let's run off a couple Well of Souls issues that I have. So first of all, yeah, the escape route, I mean, he pushes this block out. It's like they've uncovered the thing. Why wouldn't they follow it down through a couple bodies and realize that they got the Well of Souls? Uh, in addition to that, speaking of the Well of Souls, you know, the, he, he opens up that, you know, they, they crowbar open the, the entrance and you see the air Tupperware out. Psh, and then they go in there. There's snakes alive down there. So first of all, if you've got an opening on the other end of it, it wouldn't be vacuum sealed. Secondly, if these snakes are alive, something's got to be coming in and out of there. Like they got to be living on something. And what I really don't understand is why Indy, upon discovering the location, doesn't just, you know, basically double back, get into Cairo, contact the U.S. Marines, tell them, like, is the government not backing him up at all? No, because then he'd lose his find. He's probably afraid that if he leaves the site... Uh, The Nazis will come find it. But for God's sake, the Nazis didn't notice 35 guys on top of a hill digging past dusk. No one else is working. But Indy's out there digging with all his men singing loud. I would have hoped that a German guard might have walked up there and just questioned it. Yeah, or maybe someone would have noticed when there was gunfire uh, around the, the wing when it was trying to take off. Also really curious that they had an airplane with rear propellers uh, attempting to take off without an airstrip? Like, what was the plan there? Was it just going to spin around in circles until it got into the sky? I mean, a plane like that, again, in the 30s, is going to need some serious runway. No, I, I I did not question it. All of these things that we're talking about now, I, I don't think detracted from the movie. As I've mentioned before, I live in Orlando, and Universal Studios has the Indiana Jones Adventure, which it's the stunt spectacular, I think they call it. And they replicate a few of the big scenes. The boulder, uh, they do uh, the bazaar where they're kind of falling through some of the canopies and and some of the basket routine that they do with Marion. But they've always struggled. My friend did Indiana Jones for years, and they would struggle to find actors to do the German mechanic role. He asked me for years and years to do it because they couldn't find anybody like 6'7", Aryan, and in the shape to play it. Now, a few years later, I wish I'd done it. It would have been something fun to do. But uh, great scenes. I don't question why there's no airstrip. I don't question the fact that there's no way that plane could fly or why they put the fuel truck there or that the, the guards don't respond quick enough. It was needed to move the plot along. The action was fun. And they don't give us two seconds in the movie to breathe or question anything. I think you hit on something there that was that was really great is that the degree of fun that you're having, if you're on, you know, a, a great roller coaster, uh, you don't stop to think about the plot. What's the plot of this roller coaster, right? Uh, there, there's a scene where they they're, you know, they're both dumped into the well of souls. Marion is thrown in, surprisingly grabs onto the statue and then kind of bumps her way down. Of course, Indy catches her. Of course, no snakes, you know, bite them. The the asp scene, though, when these snakes are around there and she jumps on his back, like, you know me, you know, I hate physical comedy. I hate slapstick. I laughed out loud. I mean, I'm sitting there watching the movie by myself middle of the night and I just start laughing because she does such a great job of physical comedy there. The two of them are playing off each other. Um, I'm just having so much fun again. And with the, with the fight scene uh, with the plane, you know, he, he kicks the first guy, beats his ass. And the, the next guy shows up. And meantime, you got the pilot now out with his gun shooting at him. It's just, it's a lot of fun. And, and I have no complaints at the overall pacing of it, the overall storytelling. One thing I noticed that might be a little crazy and bear with me here. This is for the Harry Potter fans out there. I, you know, I mentioned uh, when I thought that the picture of the dead guy in Batman was Bill Paxton, and then I went and looked, and other people thought this too. Here's another thought I had that I went on the internet, and of course, the internet being the internet, other people thought this too. Uh, Indy says to Marion in the snake scene, he says that, uh, you know, he says basically, wave this fire at anything but Slytherin. And Marion responds, this whole place is Slytherin. And I got, oh my God, I was like, is that where... J.K. Rowling got Slytherin from? Like for Harry Potter? Is that? And so I went and looked online, and there are threads devoted to whether Slytherin 
came from this scene. And somebody even took the moment to point out that a few minutes later, when they're going through the Well of Souls and there's all the dead bodies, that one of the skulls has a snake coming out of its mouth, which is the mark for the Death Eaters in the Harry Potter series. So then, <laughs> then you've got people who are actually looking for more crossover explanations between. So there's go online, check this out. There are entire threads dedicated to how Indiana Jones and Harry Potter might be in the same universe, and a lot of the magic involved in the in in how these traps are set are actually done by wizards. It's fascinating shit. Well, it's, it's understandable that they would check that because in production they did intentionally hide Easter eggs. Uh, the scene where they're lifting the the ark out, the hieroglyphics on the case it has R two D two and three C P O. So I wouldn't be surprised that there's a lot more buried. Did did Rawlings come out and say whether or not she got some inspiration from this? Was there any definitive answer? There's been no, and she's usually pretty good about about confirming or denying these sorts of things. I don't even know if she's heard of this one, but as far as I could tell, there was she didn't confirm or deny. Uh, that this was happening. I think it's it's unlikely only because of the sense of the fact that, you know, uh, the the snake coming out of the mouth of a skull is is an age old symbol. You, you can see it through many different uh, pieces of art and many different cultures. Um, also, as far as Slytherin goes, I think that probably Slytherin, obviously, because their their mark, their house mark is the snake. I think probably snake slither. So, I mean, it makes it makes sense. I don't think there's any connection there, but it's nice to think about. So I watched this movie last night and my daughter was asleep, so I had to keep the volume down a bit. I finally decided I wasn't getting the true experience, so I put on uh, my my headphones. This movie, without the John Williams score, is nowhere near the final product. We focus a lot of times on special effects, on the plot, on the acting. The John Williams score is an additional component that makes this movie. Whether it's the the tension that you feel within the um, the well of souls, or the action fighting on the back of the plane, or Indiana being dragged behind the German truck carrying the ark, the music sets the mood and it is driving you forward. It's almost near perfection. No, I love a, a great score to a movie. I think it's much more powerful than just playing, you know, songs that people might recognize or having like a, a groovy soundtrack. I mean, there are movies like Train Spotting, like Hackers, that have wonderful soundtracks that really add to the movie. But an original score that sticks it, especially in something this epic uh, in a period piece, and it's unmistakably John Williams. Uh, it's got that broadness to it, that huge use of brass, and and kind of a whimsy. Uh, when everything succeeds, you know, I I was absolutely t- taken away with it too. Uh, you mentioned in your notes the uh, the the portable clothes hanger scene and how the, the tension there. And I agree. I'm like, why am I being freaked out by this? You know, by this scene. And I go, oh, it's it's the music. It's setting it's setting the tone there. So absolutely agree with you, Big D. So we get past the truck thing. We got the iconic whip drag where he climbs back in the truck. You know, again, you've got these these cars rushing down the the dirt road and. And Indy riding a super fast horse that manages to take all these guys out. I mean, that, does it get more fun than that? As preposterous as this is, you, you just would have stopped the truck and all the guards, the 15 guys in the in the motorcade would have just surrounded Indiana. But they keep driving. I don't question that. It's fun. It, it is. How many times have we seen subsequently the, the fight in the cab of a truck? This was the originator of that. The throwing him through the glass, he's grabbing onto the radiator guard, and he's going under it. It was fantastic. My heart was racing, and I know exactly what's going to happen. As much as this scene works, I think it's also responsible for some of the problems later in the franchise. They tried to replicate some of these original scenes, and it didn't work. You can see much of this chase from the dig site to Cairo with the Ark in the Crystal Skull with the monkeys swinging in the trees and the trucks in a convoy and the fights in the cab and the motorcycles. And they tried to duplicate it and they could never get near the original. Completely agree. Uh, So wrapping things up, the next day a Nazi U-boat appears and intercepts the ship. Belloc and Dietrich seize the Ark and Marion, but they can't locate Jones, who stows away aboard the U-boat and travels with them to an island in the Aegean Sea. Once there, Belloc plans to test the power of the Ark before presenting it to Hitler. Jones reveals himself and threatens to destroy the Ark with a Panzerfaust, but Belloc calls his bluff and Jones surrenders rather than destroy such an important historical artifact. The Nazis take Indy and Marion to an area where the Ark will be opened and tie them to a post to observe. 
Belloc performs a ceremonial opening of the Ark, which appears to contain nothing but sand, all that remains of the Ten Commandments. Suddenly, angelic host-like beings emerge from the Ark. Indy cautions Marion to keep her eyes closed and not to observe what happens next. Belloc and the others look on in astonishment as the apparitions are suddenly revealed to be angels of death. A vortex of flame forms above the Ark and shoots bolts of fiery energy into the gathered Nazi soldiers, killing them all. As Belloc, Tote, and Dietrich all scream in terror, the Ark turns its fury on them. Dietrich's head shrivels up, Tote's face is melted off his skull, and Belloc Belloc's head explodes. Flames then engulf the remains of the doomed assembly, save for Indy and Marion, and the pillar of fire rises to the sky. The Ark's lid is blasted high into the air before dropping, of course, back down onto the Ark and sealing it. Jones and Marion find their ropes miraculously burned off, and they embrace. So up to this point, Indiana's been kind of the everyman. He's doesn't have any super abilities. He can be hurt. So nothing he does really surprises me until we get to the U-boat scene. And Indiana is going to try to sneak on with the entire crew of that steamer ship waving at him goodbye like the Titanic is is heading out of the dock. How did, did that strike you wrong? Did you wonder how did Indiana go from the outside of a U-boat and make it to the island? Uh, not just that. I mean, I wondered how he swam to the U-boat. Like, that that was quite a distance to cover in a very short time. He must be an incredible swimmer. But I stupidly uh, didn't catch that the sub was diving. And so I just thought that the U-boat just sort of chugged its way back to base. Uh, you have a different explanation. Well, I thought originally that somehow he had snuck his way into the sub. And I was like, that's preposterous. You, you have a military vessel the commands are being given for the sub to get underway and to dive. How did he open up one of the locks to then sneak into a sub? A sub is like a tin can. You you have guys that share racks. They call them hot racks. Your bed in a submarine is shared with another sailor. There's nowhere for Indiana to hide. So I was like, this is a joke. Are we just supposed to not question it? And that's exactly what they wanted you to do. I went and looked. The original scene the sub gets underway and just goes enough under the surface that the periscope is sticking out of the water. Indiana grabs the periscope and is dragged behind it, almost surfing the entire way to the island. To me, I think that would have ruined the scene. Would you have been okay with Indiana surfing? Or did you like it better that they left it hoping the audience wouldn't pay attention to it? Yeah, absolutely not. That would not work at all if you had the periscope there. So, I mean, it reminds me of, you know, storytelling, right? If you're reading a a, a storybook uh, for kids or somebody's telling you a story, a fable, a legend, sometimes the details are skipped, right? You don't ask about Pericles or Hercules and how they did certain things. They just did it, right? But I agree with you that this takes Jones from an everyman into something entirely different. Um I think, again, it's something I'm willing to forgive because I want to know what happens when they get to the base, right? And and they deliver on that. So I'm willing to forgive the fact that they just skipped across it. I'd much rather see them just skip that detail than to show us something absolutely cheesy. So this final scene, uh, when they open the arc, I saw it as a seven-year-old and it terrified me. The idea of just faces melting, this unseen biblical power, I really lost quite a bit of sleep and it gave me nightmares. As an adult, did you think it was campy? Did you think it was cute? Did you enjoy it? Was it effective? So I thought it still looked pretty good. I mean, considering the years that have passed, uh, this movie is almost as old as I am. And, you know, again, I thought it looked pretty good considering. But that, that doesn't even matter because you can really get to the plot point of it, too, that at, uh, up until this point, Indy should be dead a million times over, right? If anybody was competent at all among the Nazis, he would be a goner. It works out a little too well for him. But I honestly didn't mind. And, and there's a reason for that. You know, we sit there and we scoff at James Bond uh, and Goldeneye or Batman in the 1989 Tim Burton Batman because it looks cheesy. It doesn't make sense. But more importantly, those movies fail to make us root for the good guy. We weren't in love enough with the character. With Indy, we love him. We know he's outgunned. We know he's outmatched. The only way he's going to win is a miracle, uh, which is exactly what we see. You know, I mean, it, he needs angels to interview on his behalf. But you love him. You love Marion. You want them to win. And so you're willing to forgive everything else. And that is just good movie making. And I think it's also character development. He starts off the movie questioning biblical hocus pocus magic he's he's a non-believer the movie is his arc from a non-believer to now he sees the potential power 
And when he's telling Marion, close your eyes, we're right there with him. And as a kid, I closed my eyes because I was afraid. So finally, in Washington, D.C., the Army intelligence agents inform Jones and Marcus Brody that the Ark is someplace safe and will be studied by, and they say several times, quote, top men. The Ark is shown being stored in a giant government warehouse among countless other similar crates and scene. This was the first time as a kid that I started to, to question authority. I figured, why would the government lie to Indiana? They, they have to be doing uh, what they're saying they're doing. They have to be researching this. And when they wheel it into that warehouse, I remember being shocked. It was the first time that I questioned what I was being told and made me wonder what other things the government was keeping secrets. And after this, I became a, a huge UFO fan and started reading up about Area 51. But it made me question things. Yeah, I, I took it as a, very metaphorically, I, I really took it as a, a, a form of parallelism here, where you've got uh, Belloc talking about the recurring motif of like the pocket watch. And, and he refer, you know he says that this pocket watch I bought off the street, it was only a couple bucks, but you know, give it a thousand years and it's going to be worth, you know, it's going to be priceless. And again, with Indy, he says that, you know, when he's down in the well of souls, he says that, you know, leave you down there long enough, even you might be worth something, you know? And so we've got this idea of, the, of these tombs, right? And there's an irony there, a parallelism uh, to Indiana Jones risking his life to go take the Ark out of one tomb, you know, only to be held uh, in now what we revere as a god, our government, right, in their stronghold, in their vault. And so I thought that it was interesting when they pan back and you see the whole uh, building there, the warehouse there, and you see that there's all these other artifacts there, you kind of realize like, this is its own tomb, this is its own vault. And so I thought that was a pretty cool touch uh, and a, really a perfect way to end the movie where you leave it open to future movies in the series, yet at the same time, you've got a satisfying closure. So now is the time when we will rate the movie on the Shat Meter. So we're doing, again, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, the Shat Meter basically is a measure of how many wipes it would take to get this movie off your bum. A perfect score would be zero wipes. So you're in the map room. Everything is pristine and clean. Five wipes would be like falling into the well of souls and just having snakes all over your asps. Get it? All right. So, Dick, I, I don't think we have any... Um, question what your rank is going to be, but let's go ahead with your rating first. So listeners were upset recently when I gave Fight Club a zero. It's all subjective. It's more to me a measure of less, is it a perfect movie, like the best of all times, or does it live up to your memory? Because that's our mission statement. Say, how does this compare to your memory? To me, it's a zero wipe. It has to. There's some minor problems. You'd think it ran a little long. I didn't notice it. Right from the jump, the pacing is perfect. The action starts. There's a character that we've never met before. Within 15 minutes, we're in love with him. He's introducing us to the little elements that become iconic, lowering his hat over his eyes, telling Marion to trust me, his fear of snakes. Things today that we take for granted were introduced in a way here that made us love this character right off the bat. The action was fantastic. Once it started, we didn't have a second to breathe, and I don't see any way they could have made this better. I get goosebumps thinking about it. I don't want to just gush all over the movie, but I felt the same way that I did. Back in June of 1981, Zero Wipes. Excellent. I, you know, I mentioned that the movie lost a little bit of steam toward the end, but I can't help but also fall in love with this movie. Uh, this is better than I remember the first time I saw it, which is saying something, you know. Um, I get you got to get to the point where this is 1981. Like I still cannot believe this movie was made in 19. Like you said, this movie could have been made yesterday uh, as a period piece, and with just some slight tweaks on the special effects at the end, it would have been you wouldn't know the difference. For me, the big thing was you know our other perfect movie that we've had uh, in the in the past. We talk about a zero white movie was um, was Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction was very, very well done. It changed movies forever. It was stylistic. It was beautiful to watch. Here's the thing. It didn't attempt anything nearly as big as this. Pulp Fiction didn't have any epic action scenes. It didn't attempt to uh, show us uh, a whole world that we had never seen before. What's inside of tombs? You know, how does... How does magic work with uh, with the Ark of the Covenant? Like, there is so much a bigger scale going on here. It's easy to pull off a perfect movie if you're doing it small, right? A couple character scenes or people talking to each other in a room, a lot of dialogue, nothing really that ambitious. This was hugely ambitious, and to pull it off, 
I, I can't help but say this is a zero wipe movie. It 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 just nailed it. And, and in addition, watching other movies fail to be what this was really shows you how well done it was. Um, so I can't say enough about it. I agree with you, Big D. Zero wipes. And I know Roger before we even before we even talked about doing this movie, he's not here, but he is a massive fan of this movie. Also, with zero wipes on on his side. Also, think about we're you're comparing it to Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction was an R-rated movie with a limited audience. This movie is beloved, even in 81, by adults, by kids. Everyone seems to love this movie. There's nobody that, that I've met that really doesn't like it. All right, so that brings us to another perfect movie. This is our second perfect movie of all time. Uh, oh, let zero. me explain to people. So, yes, you mentioned in there that our previous perfect movie was Pulp Fiction. Although Roger and I did give Fight Club two zeros gene gave it a one wipe so right now this is our second perfect zero wipe all right so this is our second perfect movie unanimous decision uh next week uh we have uh paul verhoven movies and the options were robocop total recall basic instinct and starship troopers i gotta be honest i was hoping for robocop but it was clear we had a good battle up there into the end between Total Recall and Starship Troopers, but 97 Starship Trooper, it will be the movie next week. And I know you guys are excited to do it. We are. I, I don't think anything is going to be more exciting for Raj than hearing that we gave this zero wipes. He's going to feel vindicated. He'll never let us hear the end of it that we uh, that we loved at Raiders of the Lost Ark. But, uh, but Starship Troopers, he and I are both big fans of that movie. Uh, we see it as a, a brilliant bit of satire. And uh, it's got Neil Patrick Harris, which anything with him in it, I, I love. So uh, I'm really excited to be watching that one again. It's been a few years, so I hope it still holds up. Please, please don't disappoint me. Oh, it's not gonna. It's not gonna hold up. No, back in college, when I first kind of thought of reviewing movies, my friend across the hall, the two movies that spurred this interest that we felt were absolute just garbage was Twister, which we already did, and it didn't do very well. The second was Starship Troopers. So I don't know why you guys have this love for it. I remember it being a hot mess from the cast, the plot, the tone to the terrible bugs. I think you're going to be disappointed. It was intentionally campy. No, it wasn't. It absolutely was. Uh, well, we'll see you next week. All right, now is the part of the show where we do our shout outs to close out. Uh, shout outs are basically a way of saying you support Shout the movies by going to shoutthemovies.com, scrolling down until you see the shout out slide out. That sounds terrible. Uh, you click on there and just put your name in there, and we'll we'll read your name on the podcast as a big thank you. Uh, this week's shout outs go out to Marty, Charisma, Giovanna, and Ty E. Thank you so much for visiting Shat the Movies. If you want to email us, you can email us at hosts at shatthemovies.com. And uh, we will, you can give us suggestions, comments. Uh, if you want to see a particular theme, go ahead and write us about that. And we will uh, do our best to put it up there for vote. Um, that concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shat the Movies. Facebook, search for Shat the Movies Podcast. Our website, as we mentioned before, is shatthemovies.com. Email hosts at shatthemovies.com. And we're everywhere fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by iTunes, please leave a five-star review. That helps the podcast grow. Also, you can check out our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we review TV series such as Westworld, Taboo, and we're currently doing American Gods, almost through with that series. And we've got Game of Thrones coming up this summer. Everyone's really excited about that. You can find all the information on those TV shows on our website, shatontv.com. On behalf of my co-hosts, Raj and Big D, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us next week when we do Starship Troopers. Thanks for listening, and good day. And the Troopers were lovers, Ellis, but they were sweet when they killed Ellis.